If a number of battles is what makes up a war, then the Warring States period in China could be thought of a war of wars. Seven rival kingdoms warring with one another, forming and breaking alliances until only one remains for approximately 250 years. The Warring States period unfolds during the Zhou Dynasty, 1046 to 221 BC. The Zhou Dynasty holds special significance in Chinese history because it marks one of the dynasties within a historical block known as the Xia Shang Zhou era, a period considered ancient. While the earlier parts of this era were realms of myth Xia and legend Shang, the Zhou Dynasty ushered in an age where historical facts became more standardized. Writing became more prevalent as the Shang Dynasty's oracle bone script gave way to the more widely understood bronze inscriptions, and as such, many seminal works of literature emerged during this time. This paved the way for Confucianism, Taoism, and the hundred schools of thought to have far-reaching effect across society. One of these seminal texts would be the Spring and Autumn Annals, attributed to Confucius, which would provide us the context for the time of the Zhou and its decline into the Warring States period. Approximately 300 years into Zhou rule in 771 BC, the Zhou dynasty's capital of Haojing was sacked by a northern barbarian tribe. Consequently, the royal family fled, relocating the capital to Luoyang, marking the onset of the period called the Spring and Autumn Period. This shift in power decentralized control of the state due to feudal lords being compelled to take up arms themselves against the barbarian incursions into their land. The transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age also occurred during this period, enabling greater agricultural productivity and enriching feudal lords who, in turn, bolstered their militia forces. These fiefdoms coalesced into numerous tiny kingdoms, leading to territorial disputes and wars reminiscent of the game Risk. Despite numerous conflicts, the era was marked by relative civility, as the doctrine of Confucianism emphasized aligning individual philosophical and spiritual ambitions with the collective good, with the Zhou Emperor and his Mandate of Heaven at its core. However, escalating territorial ambitions of the fiefdoms continue to undermine the power of the Zhou, leading to more powerful kingdoms to declare their sovereignty. By 475 BC, Many of these tiny feudal states had absorbed one another, leading to a number of upstart kingdoms with superpowers Chu and Jin at the helm, of whom whose rivalry marked a relative state of equilibrium. The Roaring States period's genesis occurred with a succession crisis within the Kingdom of Jin, splintering it into three states. This event, known as the Partition of Jin, created a power vacuum that emboldened ambitious and insecure kingdoms to go all in on their struggle for dominance. By this time, the Zhou court's influence had dwindled to mere ceremonial significance, and the territories that they had once controlled would be embroiled in a state of total war with one another. These seven kingdoms were Yan, Chu, Qi, Zhao, Wei, Han, and Qin. The state of total war that emerged amongst these kingdoms involved mass conscription. With unparalleled population growth driven by Iron Age innovations, kingdoms were willing and able to field massive armies never seen before in world history. The Qin, for instance, had a standing army of 1 million infantry, 1,000 chariots, and 10,000 cavalry. Zhao boasted a standing army of 750,000 soldiers, 10,000 cavalry, and 1,000 chariots. Chu had a million infantry, a thousand chariots, and ten thousand cavalry as well. The standing armies of all the kingdoms combined would have numbered up to five million army personnel. Firstly, concerning the introduction of the states, the state of Wei possessed a formidable army, especially in terms of fielding heavy spears and halberds. They had a robust cavalry and engaged in extensive warfare training. Situated centrally, with borders joining other states, Wei compensated for its vulnerabilities with state-of-the-art castles, drawbridges, massive moats, walls with turrets, towers, and other fortifications. The state of Qi, located near the sea with abundant natural resources, may not have had the strongest overall army, but they benefited from an elite vanguard of shock troops and strategic wielding of diplomacy had made it the dominant force in the east. Chu was the largest state and excelled in metallurgy, which in copper, they capitalized on the Bronze Age's prosperity, and by the Iron Age, equipped their army with superior weapons and armor. They were early adopters of innovative technology, prominently using the repeating crossbow, and fielded excellent crossbowmen. 
Yen, the weakest amongst the states, had natural defensive barriers and the freedom to expand northeastward. They were perceived as rigid in their stances, but excelled as defenders and were early adopters of steel weaponry. Han emerged as the weakest of the states formed from the Jin partition, but possessed fertile lands, economic strength, and were renowned for having the finest steel weapons. The Kingdom of Han also surrounded the small rump state of Zhou, where the declining Zhou royal family still held on to some political power, and as such, the Han had a significant relationship with them that would bolster them in regional politics. The Kingdom of Zhao faced relentless attacks from the northern barbarians, principally the Xiongnu. However, their proximity to these regions granted them access to mountain horse units, making them superior in cavalry amongst the kingdoms, particularly in an age when chariots had been supplanted by the use of cavalry. Up till now, horses were primarily used for plowing, so Zhao's cavalry was a massive advantage. As for the Qin, they earned a fearsome reputation, considered the most barbaric among the Chinese kingdoms, likened to the way the Greeks viewed the Macedonians. They were a courageous people with impeccable morale, toughened by years of conflict and governed by markedly draconian policies. Every facet of society revolved around war. Technological advancements during the Iron Age in China heightened weapon lethality, initiating a technological arms race that significantly influenced the nation's craftsmanship standards. Philosophically, the era known as the Warring States period is also termed the era of the 100 schools of thought due to the diverse philosophical schools it birthed, much of it being born due to the wars. Politics, culture, philosophy, technology came to almost exclusively be involved with the war. The resources of each state was prioritized for war, and men were regularly conscripted in mass numbers to take part in the almost endless conflicts that erupted. Where before warfare between the nobility was constrained by ceremonial rites and feudal etiquette, military doctrine became significantly more ruthless, and generals fielded a reputation for being butchers. The story begins in the year 403 BC, within the halls of the Zhou court King Wei Lie officially acknowledged the states of Zhao, Wei, and Han as vassals for the now defunct state of Jin. This act not only granted them equal footing with other formidable warring states, but also signaled an upset in the fragile balance of power. The meteoric rise of the three united Jin states under the unyielding leadership of the Kingdom of Wei heralded an era of territorial expansion and ambition. At the epicenter of this, was the Marquess Wen of Wei, a visionary leader with strategic acumen and military might. He annexed the state of Zhongshan to the northeast, while simultaneously pushing westward across the Yellow River to claim the fertile lands of Shihu. However, as Wei's dominion expanded, the burgeoning might of Wei unnerved the kingdom of Zhao, prompting it to cease their alliance. In 383 BC, Zhao relocated its capital to Handan, and launched a preemptive strike against the diminutive state of Wei. Sensing imminent peril, Wei made an alliance with Wei, igniting a fierce conflict between Wei and Zhao that would mark the beginning of their on-again, off-again relationship over the centuries. A mosaic of states emerged, each carving out its dominion amidst the shifting sands. Zhao's realm sprawled from the Shanxi Plateau to the fringes of Qi, while Wei's influence extended eastward to Qi, Lu, and Song. Meanwhile, the resilient state of Han maintained a tenuous grip over the Yellow River Valley, encircling the Zhou royal domain at Luoyang. In this intricate dance of power, the state of Qi had emerged to the fore. Upon the death of Duke Kong in 379 BC, the mantle of leadership transitioned to the influential house of Tian, signaling a new era of dominance. One of the key figures in Qi's story is the military strategist Sun Bin. Sun Bin, descendant of Sun Tzu from the state of Qi, studied in the mountains under the tutelage of the hermit Gui Gu Zi, while studying alongside his close friend Pang Jun. Pang Jun left his studies early to make his career as a warrior. He promised Sun Bin that when he'd made a name for himself, he would recommend him and share the wealth and honor with him. Pang Jun traveled to Wei, where he became a general, but knowing that Sun Bin was more talented, Pang Jun invited him to Wei and secretly arranged to have him framed on charges of treason. Pang Jun had Sun Bin's kneecaps removed, so he would become crippled and unable to fulfill his ambitions and usurp him. When Sun Bin learned of Pang Jun's betrayal, he managed to escape back to the state of Qi, 
where his talent caught the attention of the benevolent and wise King of Qi, who made him military advisor of his armies, paving the way for the growth of Qi's military strength. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of Wei, King Hui, a ruler with a vision, sought to fortify his realm and reforge all alliances. In a series of strategic maneuvers between 362 and 359 BC, he orchestrated friendly territorial exchanges with neighboring states of Han and Zhao. This reformed alliance would prove life-saving as an ascendant Qin loomed large, culminating in the fateful Battle of Ximen in 364 BC, where Wei suffered a stinging defeat. Only the timely intervention of Zhao would spare Wei from complete collapse. Sensing the imminent threat posed by Qin's relentless aggression, King Hui prudently relocated his capital to Daliang in 361 BC, seeking a sanctuary from Qin's voracious appetite for conquest. However, in a daring gambit in 354 BC, King Hui of Wei reneged the alliance with their one-time saviors and unleashed a relentless onslaught against the beleaguered state of Zhao. As the vice tightened around Zhao's capital, Handan, a beacon of hope emerged from the Kingdom of Qi. Qi would enter into an alliance with Zhao and Sun Bin would have a chance at revenge against his rival, Pang Jun. Sun Bin implemented his strategy, a diversionary attack on Wei's capital. The audacious ploy immortalized as the besiege Wei to save Zhao stratagem forced the Wei forces to retreat back to save their capital but were ambushed by Qi forces lying in wait. Pang Jun would be killed in the battle and Sun Bin would be immortalized as one of the greatest strategists of that era. This culminated in Wei's catastrophic defeat, greatly diminishing Wei thereafter, who would never fully recover to its former strength. The ascendant King Wei of Qi embarked on a relentless campaign to reclaim lost territories, unleashing his military might against the states of Zhao, Wei, and Wei. Such was the ferocity and efficacy of these campaigns that the region was awestruck. Qi emerged as the preeminent powerhouse of the time, and with its newfound power, it declared itself officially as a kingdom, severing its long-standing ties with the venerable Zhou dynasty. At this time, Qin was very poor, decimated by non-stop warfare. Under the leadership of Duke Xiao of Qin, an open invitation to the scholars of all 100 schools of thought was made to request assistance in strengthening the state. With the Kingdom of Wei having greatly diminished in power, many of their ambitious thinkers and strategists sought employment elsewhere. One of these was Minister Shang Yang. The Prime Minister of Wei told the Wei King that the little-known Shang Yang was so ambitious and talented that he insisted that he should take his own place as Prime Minister. But if he doesn't do this, Shang Yang should be immediately executed for fear he might serve a rival power. King Hui of Wei didn't heed these warnings and in the aftermath of the Qi War with Wei, Shang Yang would offer his support to Duke Xiao of Qin, who would give him free reign to manage the kingdom's affairs. Shang Yang was the founder of one of the 100 schools of thought known as legalism, a philosophy of governance and statecraft known for its totalitarianism, cynical view of human nature, and Machiavellianism. For instance, Lord Shang had the Duke organize groups of people to spy on families for the betterment of the state. The death penalty, which was cutting someone in two at the waist, became a punishment doled out for just about anything. Intellectualism and philosophical thought were strictly censored as it would only lead to opposition to the legalist policies. This led to book burnings, particularly of Confucius texts, due to its more humanistic view of hierarchical leadership. The harsh rules were applied to all, including to all ministers and even the ruling family. This came back to haunt Shang Yang, as when the duke died, he would eventually receive his own punishments by being cut in two at the waist by two chariots. In the end though, his policies gave Qin an extremely fearsome reputation. The state became wealthy and the population was constantly prepared for war. These sweeping changes, ranging from agrarian reforms to population control measures, catalyzed Qin's ascendance, sowing the seeds for its future dominance. As Qin's sphere of influence expanded, the geopolitical chessboard witnessed a series of dramatic confrontations. From Wei's valiant resistance against Han to Qi's audacious interventions, the region became a crucible of shifting alliances and betrayals. The strategic acumen of luminaries like Sun Bin and the diplomatic machinations of statesmen like Su Qin epitomized this era's volatile dynamics. 
The crescendo of conflict reached a fever pitch in 318 BC, as the coalition of states launched a concerted assault on the burgeoning Qin state, yet despite their collective might, Qin emerged unscathed, underscoring its unbeatable resilience. As the dust settled, Qin's inexorable march towards hegemony became evident. The disparate kingdoms ensnared in a web of mutual distrust and intrigue, grappled with existential threats, using the different philosophical schools of thought to carve out a strategy. One of these 100 schools of thought was known as the School of Diplomacy, a way by which statesmen would implement the strategic use of diplomacy to come out on top of the numerous power struggles. One of the sub-branches of this philosophy, which was also a venerated school of thought in its own right, was the school of horizontal and vertical alliances. This was a strategy that either advocated for horizontal diplomacy, which meant allying with dominant powers, Qin or Qi, riding their coattails of victory over the entire Middle Kingdom, or vertical diplomacy, which meant all the weaker powers forming an alliance to defeat the more powerful ascendant power. In the Kingdom of Qi, Lord Mengchang brokered a westward alliance with Wei in hand, forming a horizontal alliance, then went one step further to expand the alliance to Qin. This horizontal alliance could have secured peace in the realm, however, the exclusion of Zhao from this arrangement would sow the seeds of future discord in this alliance. In 298 BC, Zhao offered Qin an alliance and Lord Mengchang was driven out of Qin. The remaining three allies, Qi, Wei, and Han, attacked and defeated Qin. This horizontal alliance victory would be followed up with attacks on Yan and Chu after. Under Lord Mengchang's astute leadership, Qi reasserted itself as the dominant force, once again with its armies sweeping across the land, toppling adversaries and annexing territories. Yet the pendulum of fortune swung swiftly. Accused of treachery, Lord Mengchang fled, leaving behind a fractured alliance system which quickly fell apart. In 285 BC, the success of Qi had fried the other states. The once venerated but now exiled Lord Mengchang found employment in the Kingdom of Wei, where under his leadership, he would get revenge on his former homeland. With Wei at the helm, he formed an alliance with Qin, Zhao, and Yan. Yan had normally been a relatively weak ally of Qi, and Qi feared little from this quarter, so Yan's onslaught under the great general Yue Yi came as a devastating surprise for Qi. Simultaneously, the other allies attacked from the west. Chu declared itself an ally of Qi, but contended itself with annexing some territory in the north. This vertical alliance against Qi devastated its armies, while the territory of Qi was reduced to two cities. The state of Qi would miraculously recover much of its lost territory against the alliance, but the damage would be done and the kingdom of Qi would henceforth be a shadow of itself. Amidst this turmoil, the Kingdom of Qin surged forth back into the fall with visionary strategists like Fan Sui, envisioning authoritarian reforms and expansionist strategies that would culminate in Qin's unyielding march towards supremacy. In 278 BC, General Bai Qi of Qin launched an offensive from the newly acquired territory in Sichuan, targeting the western regions of Chu. This resulted in the capture of Chu's capital, Ying, and the loss of its territories along the Han River to the west, pushing Chu's influence further eastward. Following Chu's defeat in 278 BC, the major powers left standing were Qin in the west and Zhao in the northern central region. Diplomatic negotiations became limited, with conflicts principally determining the outcome. Zhao's strength had notably increased under the reign of King Wuling of Zhao, 325 to 299 BC. Under his leadership, he bolstered his cavalry by emulating the northern nomadic tactic in 307 BC, expanded territory in northern Shanxi Plateau in 306 BC, defeated the northeastern state of Zhongshan in 305 BC, and extended control over the east-west stretch of the Yellow River north of the Ordos Loop in 304 BC. Later, during King Huiwen's rule, 298 to 266 BC, Zhao continued its expansion, leveraging skilled advisors to further dominate weakened states like Qi and Wei. In 296 BC, his general, Lian Po, achieved victories against two Qin armies. In 265 BC, King Zhao Xiang of Qin initiated hostilities by targeting the vulnerable Han state, which controlled the crucial Yellow River Passage into Qin territory. Advancing northeast through Wei lands, he aimed to isolate Han's Shandang territory, situated between Luoyang and Zhao. While the Han king 
considered surrendering the city of Shandang. A local governor defied this and handed it over to Zhao. In response, Zhao dispatched General Lian Po, positioning his forces at Changping, while Qin deployed General Wang He. Recognizing the risk of a direct confrontation, Lian Po opted to remain fortified, leading to a prolonged deadlock of three years. Frustrated by Lian Po's defensive stance, the Zhao king dispatched General Zhao Kuo, promising a decisive engagement. Concurrently, Qin replaced Wang He with the aggressive general Bai Qi. Seizing an opportunity when Zhao Kuo ventured out of his defenses, Bai Qi enveloped the Zhao forces after enduring a 46-day siege. The besieged and starved Zhao troops capitulated in September 260 BC, allegedly of all prisoners, resulting in a staggering loss of 400,000 Zhao soldiers. Although they later attempted to besiege the Zhao capital, this effort faltered when ambushed from behind, but the damage done against Zhao eliminated any possibility of continuing to withstand significant resistance to Qin dominance. While other states might have collectively withstood Qin's might, their fragmented efforts failed to present a united front. With Zhao now too weakened beyond repair, at this stage, there was no longer any other dominant players in China that could withstand Qin and each kingdom would start to fall one by one to the Qin war machine. The first state to be fully conquered by Qin would be the ceremonial rum state of Western Zhou in 256 BC. King Zhao of Qin captured Luoyang, seizing the Nine Cauldrons, an item of ritualistic importance which was crafted by the founding Yellow Emperor himself thousands of years ago, symbolically establishing himself as the Son of Heaven. Han, Wei, Chu, Zhao and Yan would be conquered in that order and finally by 221 BC, former rival superpower Qi capitulated, cementing Qin's dominance and heralding the ascension of the Qin King Ying Zheng who proclaimed himself as Qing Shi Huangdi, the first sovereign emperor of Qin and marking a new historic era of imperial China. In this tapestry of conquests and betrayals, alliances and treacheries, the ancient land of China witnessed the rise and fall of numerous kingdoms. Through intrigue, strategy and sheer determination, the kingdom of Qin emerged triumphant, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of history. Yet, as with all epochs, it serves as a poignant reminder of the impermanence of power and the cyclical nature of history. Thanks a lot for watching guys, and thank you very much to my Patreon subscribers who made this video possible. If you want to contribute to the growth of this channel and the dissemination of knowledge about China's history and anthropology, please consider becoming a patron for as little as $5 a month so I can continue making more educational content for you to enjoy. And if you want to subscribe already, please consider subscribing and ticking the little bell icon so you can stay up to date on my latest videos. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.